Welcome to Reviewing the Golden Age, where we review astounding science fiction for as long as it remains astounding. Today, The Dangerous Dimension by L. Ron Hubbard. Lafayette Ronald Hubbard was born on the 13th of May 1911 in Nebraska, but his family quickly moved to Helena, Montana. He was, from a very young age, an extraordinary person with a strong sense of right and wrong and a fierce desire for adventure. Even at preschool, he would challenge much older bullies to fights in order to protect his peers. At a very young age, he became a blood brother of the local Indian tribe, so greatly did he impress them. As he grew older, he loved the outdoors and playing with horses. He travelled with his family to many faraway places such as China, and saw things that few of his class and background at the time could have imagined. As a young adult, Lafayette would continue his strange life. He would travel through Asia and be horrified by, by the poverty that he saw there. He saw people stepping over starving men lying in the streets. He also, however, learned of the religions of the East, such as Buddhism, and was impressed with their wisdom. However, this only led him to be in further dismay that all this wisdom did not allow them to help their fellow man who lay there suffering. A resolution began to grow in Lafayette to search out the answers to the puzzles of life, whatever they might be. Or at least, this is the story as Lafayette, who is better known as L. Ron Hubbard, would tell it. Others tell different tales. And that is one of the many problems with making a video about L. Ron Hubbard. A storyteller by trade, his own life was one of the chief objects of his talent, and sorting facts from fiction is quite the challenge. By his own account, his life was one of an endless adventure and heroism. He was a war hero, an adventure, a nuclear scientist, and a great searcher after truth and morality. But when you ask those who knew him or look at official records, you will find many of his claims being contradicted. Due, his followers would assure you, to the malice of conspirators who opposed and still opposed the great good he accomplished. Luckily, sorting facts from fiction isn't a task we need to do right now, because here we will be looking not chiefly at Hubbard himself, but rather the stories he told. Specifically, the science fiction stories. If you know anything about L. Ron Hubbard, you likely know him as the science fiction writer who started the religion Scientology, which was born out of his book describing his, let us say, unique approach to treating mental health, Dianetics. This is sort of true, but it would be even truer to call L. Ron Hubbard a pulp writer who started the religion. Most of what he wrote is not science fiction. As I have discussed before on this channel, while science fiction is certainly the best remembered part of early pulp writing, it made up an only small part of pulp at the time, and certainly not the most popular part. Hubbard had his hand in a lot of pies. He wrote western stories of frontier America. He wrote fantasy stories. He wrote stories of cowboys and Indians. And he also wrote stories of pirate adventures on the high seas. Indeed, I have read that stories of nautical adventures were those adventures which he loved best, which would come to be relevant years later when he would reinvent himself as the captain of his own fleet, the Sea Org of Scientology. Hubbard only began writing science fiction in 1938, after several years of writing pulp. Apparently, he was initially forced on Campbell, the editor of Astounding, who will certainly have a video of his own sometime, by the magazine owners, but almost immediately he became a popular and prolific writer of stories, not just for Astounding, but also Campbell's other magazine, The Fantasy Unknown. Indeed, I have heard it argued that his fantastic stories in Unknown are much better than his science fiction ones, but that isn't for us to judge here. Rather, let us look at the very first science fiction story Hubbard ever wrote, The Dangerous Dimension, published July 1938. The Dangerous Dimension begins with a brilliant mathematician 
and complete loser, Dr. Mudge, working on a new mathematical formula. He's trying to find a description of the negative dimension, the mental dimension that allows us to transfer our minds to different places, all the while being mercilessly harassed by his housekeeper, Doolin, whom he lives in terror of. When, however, he succeeds, he finds that he is transported to any place he imagines. Most of the story follows his rapid transportations around Earth and beyond, complete with a visit to the moon, a brief bath in the canals of Mars where he meets a mysterious woman whom he promises to return to, and almost being arrested in the courts of some mysterious alien emperor. All the while, he is trying to complete the formula that will allow him to bring his powers under his conscious control, and desperately trying not to imagine something. By the end of the story, he finally completes the formula, thus being able to control when he will and won't use his powers, and can finally think of the thing he was desperately trying not to imagine. The Sun. It's a very short story, taking up about 12 pages of astounding and rather comedic in tone. If you want to check it out yourself, it won't take more than a few minutes, so I'll put a link below. So what do I think of this little tale? Before I answer that question, I would like to discuss briefly what the general critical reception is regarding Hubbard's work. I don't usually like to do this, I'd rather give you my own thoughts on a piece than simply discuss what others have said. Besides, I want to look at little known sci-fi on this channel, which means that in many cases there isn't really much of a critical reception to speak about. But in this case, it really sheds light on the difficulties we are going to have with Hubbard in our project of reviewing the Golden Age. Let us look at part of one account of this story that I found online, published by Galaxy Press. It was because of L. Ron Hubbard's widespread popularity that Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, approached Ron to write for them. Confident his storytelling mastery would give their recently acquired magazine the circulation boost it needed. He was introduced to the new editor, John W. Campbell Jr., who was instructed to buy everything L. Ron Hubbard wrote. Ron, however, was initially reluctant, protesting that he did not write about machines and machinery, the standard ingredients of much of astounding science fiction magazine's usual content, but rather did he wrote about people. Street and Smith executives told him that this was precisely what they wanted. The result was The Dangerous Dimension, which appeared in the July 1938 issue. As Ron himself was later to recall, Rather than be a yam, bug-eyed monsters, Dangerous Dimension used a philosophic theory that predates Western culture that an individual's location depends on that person's ideas, and not the location. The story was unusual for its philosophy, humour, and its emphasis on people and not monsters. The fans loved it. The new trend began. Circulation soared, and Campbell sighed and put his monsters and robotic societies away. One fan in particular, a young Isaac Asimov, wrote to the editor, John W. Campbell after reading the story. I assure you that I laughed myself sick over it. Some more from L1 Hubbard, please. There are, of course, no ray guns, robots or machine societies in the dangerous dimension. Instead, the dimension is the most dangerous of all. The mind of untidy, diffident, Yamal for University professor, Dr. Henry Mudge, who undergoes a startling personality change when he stumbles upon a mathematical door to a negative dimension that unlocks the key to teleportation and with that knowledge, a host of misadventures for the mild-mannered professor. The dangerous dimension marks one of the earliest uses of teleportation as the central theme of a story and it would be a reoccurring theme of L. Ron Hubbard's fiction appearing in one form or another not only in the dangerous dimension but fantasy stories such as The Ultimate Adventure and later in the international bestseller sci-fi epic Battlefield Earth, a saga of the year 2000. With the publication of his first sci-fi tale, The Dangerous Dimension, the genre took a sharp humanising turn 
that would permanently transform it in ways that few who read the story at the time could envision. Author and critic Damon Knight said it as definitively as anyone ever has when he wrote that L. Ron Hubbard cut a swath across the science fantasy world, the like of which has never been seen again. So, The Dangerous Dimension is a masterpiece, right? A genre-defining work that changed the direction of science fiction forever. Not so fast. As most of you might already have guessed, Galaxy Express is an organisation entirely devoted to promoting the works of L. Ron Hubbard. Apparently, it isn't technically an arm of the Church of Scientology, but the two are linked. The Church of Scientology and Scientologists in general have gone to enormous lengths to promote the works of L. Ron Hubbard and uphold his legacy. One can find dozens of websites online dedicated to his writings or philosophy or photography or opinions on education, all of which praise him in the most excessive terms imaginable. And, to be quite frank, I think it is fairly safe to dismiss them as motivated by misguided religious devotion, rather than a serious attempt to judge Hubbard's works on a literary basis. Another point of view you will sometimes see tossed around is that Hubbard was an utterly talentless hack whose only virtue, if he had any virtue at all, was the ability to write very fast and thus fill out the pages of pulp magazines. One can find a lot of people arguing that Hubbard is entirely without any talent. When I ask around online, this was a common response I got. A Guardian review I found refers to him as L. Ron Hubbard, a con artist, thief and talentless science fiction writer who created this religion as his get-quick scheme. Interestingly, this is often combined with a focus on Hubbard's later works, such as Battlefield Earth and Mission Earth. These have been heavily promoted by Scientologists, most infamously with the famously far bad Battlefield Earth movie, which has an almost legendary status as a bad movie. And his later works may indeed be as bad as everyone says, but I'm less confident about saying this about his early works, which did, after all, earn their success honestly and without the backing of a religious organisation. Now, admittedly the fact that I have not read much of Hubbard's early work makes this a very dubious statement. However, I'm not making it alone. Hubbard was certainly popular in his day. That quote from Isaac Asimov in the Galaxy Press Review? It is real, they're not making it up. Asimov really did love Hubbard. Granted, we're talking about early Asimov, before he had published any of his own works, but Heinlein, Vocht, even Campbell himself, not to mention so many of the readers of Astounding. Can we really dismiss them all as deluded? Because they all greatly admired Hubbard, at least for a time. Whatever modern critics may think of him, the fact remains that at the time he was well liked by the early writers and readers of science fiction. And if, upon reflection, we find Hubbard just as talentless as his most fierce critics claim, that is in itself a rather fascinating point. Because with all these esteemed witnesses from Hubbard's own time apparently loving him, if he turned out to be a complete hack, it would signify that there must have been something very significant and desirable about the topics and themes he was discussing that was lacking in better works. Nothing succeeds for no reason, and if a work entirely lacks any virtues that we can see today, then it signifies there must have been something that was unique about it at the time, and that caused people to tolerate the badness of the work to get at whatever he offered. So let us see if we can take a look at Hubbard with eyes unclouded by mindless devotion or hate, and try and read him I wish we could sponge from our minds the slightest memory of Scientology or Dianetics. My first impression of this story is that it stands somewhere between the extremes of awfulness and genius. It's mildly funny. It presents interesting ideas and thinks them through. One could certainly argue that Hubbard doesn't do much beyond developing the ideas he presents in a fairly obvious way. But then, it is a very short story. A full serial or novel needs more than exploring a single gimmick, as it were, to support it. 
But the short story is often all the better for maintaining iron focus on a single idea or theme. And it does succeed in developing its theme. Granted, most of the twists and turns are fairly obvious once the basic idea of mild-mannered professor is transported anywhere he thinks of is presented, but they are well done. The story even manages a couple of genuinely evocative scenes. For example, there is the scene where Mudge transports himself into the canals of Mars and has a very brief conversation with a woman he meets sailing there. It's a very brief passage, but Hubbard manages to smuggle enough world building into the brief conversation to make you feel like Mudge has briefly contacted a woman from another world. I was actually surprised when I read this story that certain aspects of it do seem to link to aspects of Scientology, which wouldn't be a thing for a long time, at the time of writing of course. The most obvious is the notion of mental powers. The whole story revolves around a man who gains mental powers by discovering a hidden reality about the world. For those who do not know, this is somewhat similar to what Scientology promises its members as this chart, showing the progress which the neophyte of Scientology is presented with shows. But the idea of mental powers is not an uncommon one and not unique to Hubbard, although he apparently was one of the earlier writers to make it a central part of his stories, so maybe this is no more than a coincidence. But the exact effect that these mental powers has on Mudge seem harder to explain away. Mudge starts the story as, to put it bluntly, a loser. He is utterly unable to stand up for himself and is constantly harassed and browbeaten by those around him. He is a complete pushover and doormat, abused even by his own housekeeper. The story says bluntly that Mudge was a very mild little fellow with never anything but grovelling respect for everyone. From what I understand, this is a common feature of Hubbard's early stories. In sharp contrast to the works of Heinlein, Isaac Asimov or Docky Smith, whose heroes are usually competent figures, the heroes in Hubbard's science fiction stories often start as pathetic ones, losers even. Now, I've heard it argued that this was what Hubbard thought of science fiction fans, that they were losers and that he thus created heroes he felt they would relate to. But maybe a more generous interpretation is possible. If one goes forward in time and looks at Scientology, you see that it is a religion that focuses on self-improvement, supposedly accomplished by a complicated process of mental auditing that allows you to achieve a new mental state known as clear as you proceed further up the road to total freedom. In that state, the Scientologist has said not only to have various natural abilities, or greater than natural abilities, including, at the higher levels, actual psychic powers, but also perfect control over their own emotions and subconscious mind. The similarities with Mudge, whom, by the end of the story, has gained control of his mental power and also become a stronger person who is willing to stand up for himself, is notable, and... Oh dear, I'm doing it again, aren't I? You see now the problem I have reviewing L. Ron Hubbard. I began this project with an intention of reviewing his works for their own sake, with eyes unclouded by his future. But it is so very hard to do so. Every element seems to beg to be interpreted in the light of future events. But I can't help feeling that I'm making a mistake by trying to do so. Consider... What if George Lucas was to set up a religion which controlled and abused its members? One can imagine that smart people would find many parallels between this faith and the Jedi of Lucas' earlier works. Pretty soon it would be impossible to watch Star Wars without thinking of the religion that Lucas would set up in his future, and every scene where Yoda talks nonsense or the Jedi Code is discussed would be hard to view except as a reflection of Lucas' future career. And if our aim was to understand this religion of Lucasism, that would be the correct approach. But if our aim was to understand Star Wars, I can't help but think that our view would be impoverished by this approach. 
and I really want to understand the works of Hubbard. Admittedly, it might be a fair question to ask why I want to understand them. Why Hubbard? It is a shame, maybe, that Hubbard's works are caught between the Scylla and Charvedis of unthinking devotion and unthinking rejection. But isn't that the world Hubbard chose for himself when he chose to create a religion? I've said that the point of this channel is to look at works that are little read today. The works of L. Ron Hubbard certainly qualify, at least for non-Scientologists, but then so do many by people who have not behaved so dreadfully. What about Ray Cummings, who wrote so much for Early Astounding, and whose work is depicted on the cover of this very issue? What about Lee Brackett, once called the Queen of Space Opera? Most people haven't heard of them either. Do I have any excuse for discussing Hubbard, who was, let's be honest, not a very nice person, before them? Or am I simply chasing a name that's likely to attract more views from the YouTube algorithm? I mean, yes. That is certainly part of my reason for making this video. But there is more. Hubbard's past as a science fiction writer is often presented as an amusing quirk to laugh at in descriptions of Scientology. But I believe the link was more than that. I believe that Hubbard, in creating Scientology, was drawing on ideas that were fundamental to science fiction, especially at the time. And thus by ignoring Hubbard, by trying to pretend he was nothing more than an embarrassing hack, we are forgetting a critical part of the history of science fiction itself. Let me try to explain. It was in the pages of Astounding itself that Dianetics, which Hubbard would later develop into the modern day religion of Scientology, was first placed before the public. That in itself is telling. Dianetics wasn't just a religion created by an ex-sci-fi writer, but it was presented first in the most influential science fiction magazine of the day, and perhaps all time. But there is more of interest. Let us look at one of the first issues in which Dianetics is mentioned. This issue isn't the magazine in which Hubbard himself first put forth his ideas. That wouldn't come until two issues later. But like any good editor, Campbell whetted the appetites of his readers. He had been darkly hinting that something big was coming up for several issues. There is even a letter to the editor calling him out on all this anticipation and demanding that it better be good. In Astounding Magazine, March 1950, Campbell wrote, Coming up now and in preparation is an article concerning a new science of human thought, Dianetics. L. Ron Hubbard, well known to our readers as an author, has earned a living writing while spending some 25 years doing research on the subject in developing new material. I assure you of two things. You will find the article fascinating, and it is of more importance than you can readily realise. Before you ask, Elvon Hubbard was 39 years old when this was published, and no, he had not been researching Dianetics since he was 14. The March issue also contains the final part of a sci-fi serial of Hubbard's called To The Stars. Campbell had been presenting several stories by Hubbard over the past few issues, presumably to further raise excitement about Hubbard's new venture into the realm of therapy. But it is not anything by Hubbard that I would like to focus on, but rather the very first story in the issue, the short story New Foundations by Wilma H. Shiraz. This story tells of a group of Yuwanda children, orphans, in the very near future who, due to an atomic accident, are born with greatly superior intelligence. The story tells of Peter Wells, a psychologist, attempting to gather the orphans to a home he has set up for them where their genius intellects can be nurtured. It's an odd little tale without any villains or real conflict to speak of, or even much of a plot. The majority consists of conversations between the Wonder Children and Peter Wells about their nature, poetry, religion and Thomistic philosophy. Nevertheless, despite it lacking most of what you would consider the basic ingredients of a good science fiction story, I found it oddly attractive if I would recommend it. But that isn't what is important right now. What is important is the theme of the story itself. 
This story presents the rise of a new form of humanity, better and more brilliant than the present one. It is possible that Campbell included this story deliberately in order to prepare the ground for Dianetics, but I suspect its suitability is a coincidence because stories like this were not uncommon in early science fiction. They are called the Wonder Children here, but they have many other names in other tales. Just off the top of my head, without doing any research, I was able to think of four examples. There is the Lensman series by Doc E. Smith, whom is widely considered the creator of the space opera genre. It tells the story of a galactic war that dates back to the dawn of our galaxy, which is finally concluded when the benevolent Aresians conclude a century-long breeding program to raise a small number of humans to the next level of consciousness. This group, the children of the Lens, have unprecedented mental powers and intellects and are able to defeat the sinister Adorians and thus end the billion year conflict that they have waged against civilization. Then there is Gulf by Heinlein, which I haven't read yet, but which apparently tells of a bunch of superhumans that secretly and benevolently oversee the human race. I have heard that Gulf actually influenced Hubbard with its use of the term Homo Novus for the superhumans. Hubbard himself would use the term Homo Novus for Scientologists, although honestly the idea is obvious enough that I'm not sure we can be sure there was an influence. Years before the dawn of science fiction, H.G. Wells had told the story of the food of the gods and how it came to Earth of the emergence of a race of giants destined to replace humanity. Finally, and perhaps most importantly for our discussion, there are the Slans. In A.E. A. A. E. Van Vocht's story, Slan, he depicts a race of persecuted psychic superhumans in the future. So popular was this story that early science fiction fans often identified themselves as Slans. By the way, do you know what became a Vocht? Why, he joined Dianetics and became a prominent leader in the organisation. Even after he lost interest in Scientology, as it moved increasingly towards a more explicitly religious direction, he continued to be independently involved in Dianetics for decades. Science fiction has many themes and aims. I have called it a literature of ideas in this series, but anyone who tells you that this one thing is what science fiction about is wrong, Nonetheless, I think I have convincingly demonstrated that the emergence of a new human type, a new man, as it were, was a central idea to science fiction in the Golden Age. And it wasn't restricted to science fiction. While most of the writers of Astounding would have objected to the comparison, one could make a good argument that the new Soviet man that was being raised up in the USSR was part of the same strange family albeit a somewhat distant and estranged relation. The idea that humanity was on the verge of some fundamental transformation was in the air at the time. And I don't think it takes a huge leap of logic to see that this was exactly what Hubbard was offering as acolyte. I can't say for sure if the idea of creating a new man is present in all of Hubbard's works, since I haven't read them all, but it certainly isn't restricted to them. But there is a difference between the idea of the new man as it appears in the works I have mentioned and Munch with his mathematical powers. All the examples I have given so far show the new man being born as the next step of evolution or part of a greater process of social change. This doesn't offer much hope for an individual reader to ascend. The reader of Astounding, after all, is probably not the product of a century-long breeding programme nor is a revolution something one can achieve alone. Much, however, without the spe her aid of special hereditary luck or being part of some new society, ascends himself. He solves his problems, heals his character flaws, and is granted super superhuman powers with nothing but the power of his own mind. And that is indeed an alluring prospect. And this brings one to the second factor that made the readers of Astounding so vulnerable to the ideas of Hubbard. He made it personal. Dianetics and Scientology promise not that the new man could be one of your descendants 
or the product of some complete remaking of society, but that he or she could be you, you, the random reader of Astounding, who reads tales of wonder, can step into the pages of a story and become the Superman. Right now. Right here. And so, Elrond Hubbard would give the new man another name. At first it would be clear, and later he would add Operating Thetan, as yet another level above clear. And he would convince considerable numbers of the early science fiction community into believing they could be transformed into this new man. And not just readers either. Some of the most luminous names of science fiction were at least temporarily taken in by Scientology, or its predecessor, Dianetics. I don't think you can just explain this by saying that Hubbard was somehow super charismatic and persuasive, although that may have been true to some extent. I think it was because Scientologists g he gave them a message they wanted to believe, that they could utterly recreate themselves with the tools of science into a more perfect form, just like it happened so often in the stories. It offered them personal fulfillment and power in a way very similar to that achieved by so many of the heroes they had read about. It also offered them a grand quest and narrative to be part of, both of which had so often been, been offered in fiction in the pages of Astounding. Is it any wonder that so many were attracted? I intend to read more of the works of Hubbard and might review them on this channel. I hope after everything I have said, it is clear why I think this is a worthwhile enterprise that might help reveal something about early science fiction and the culture it was part of. But understanding all this doesn't help us in fairly assessing Hubbard's fiction. It does not help us assess the quality of the dangerous dimension. I suspect many would say that is a hopeless task. It is impossible to escape one's bias, and the best one could do is acknowledge it. How can one really assess the stories of Hubbard after everything that's happened since? But you know what? Who cares about them? I'm going to pass judgment of this story on its own, taken on its own, and apart from everything I've said up till now. Three out of four stars. Screw this postmodern nonsense about it being impossible to escape bias. I like this story. It's unique and has some fun ideas. The main character is interesting. It's no masterpiece. But I think Hubbard is off to a good start. We'll see if he can sustain it.